Zombie Tech. <sighs> Welcome to Zombie Tech, a forum for engineers, scientists, and inventors to ponder on the technologies needed to survive the inevitable zombie apocalypse. She's Addie, and He's I'm Whisker. Whisker. And we've got on the line today John. Uh, John S. From underscore AZ. Arizona. Hello. <laughs> Hi, John. How's it going? Now, just to bring you guys up to speed, John is, uh, well, he was an engineer. Now he's sort of uh He's still an engineer. Now he's kind of a bomb, but... Uh, no, he's not. Like, uh, he wanders he's around awesome. town collecting garbage. Well, I'm a bossless engineer. Yeah, there, there you, you go. go. Isn't that the ideal job to have? Well, I think so. See? Yeah, I'm pretty Basically, happy if, if you got to the point where you're a bossless <laughs> engineer, you must have done something right on the way there. Yep. There you go. Yep. Uh, so uh, in his now uh, sizable free time, John is uh, working on putting together an educational uh, show mm -hmm. for his YouTube channel called Hackers Bench TV. And it's just about to get off the ground here. He's been working the last few months getting all the pieces together. And as we know, that is a very sizable task indeed. Yep. I wish I'd have known that going in. <laughs> would you have? Would you not have started it then? <laughs> um, I think I would have done things a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, I muddled through a whole lot of equipment that just wouldn't work, and ended up trashing that and having to buy new stuff. And oh. if I'd have known that going in, I could have just bought the new stuff up front and saved myself about four months of mucking around with stuff. Sure. But I think I've got it all together now. So, thankfully, the the, uh, the bar for entry has lowered a lot as far as how much it costs to get into this sort of thing. But that doesn't really when you say that to people that are interested, they they hear, "Oh, that means that I can get into it." And yeah, sure, that's true. But when we say the the cost of entry has lowered, we we don't mean that it's cheap. We mean that it's no longer a hundred thousand dollars to be able to produce a show. It's more like you're going to drop a few k to get started. Well, actually, I think you could do it for a lot less than that. <laughs> um, Depends on what you want to achieve, really. It, exactly. Cause, you know, there are a lot of. Um, and it depends video on blogs what you there. count. You know, as part of the cost too. Do you count the brand new computer that you needed? Well, do I do because the. The PC I bought is dedicated to doing the audio and video work. It's exactly. not going to do anything else. You managed to find a very cheap computer to do that with. You know, most people are using whatever computer they had on hand, and most people's normal computers weren't cheap. You know, there there's a thousand dollars right there. Uh, true, true. I may be a unique case though, because I mean, I bought the PC I bought is probably three, four years. Out of, you know, the currently available stuff, it's probably three years ago. It was brand new. Uh, so I got it really inexpensively. Right. But that PC is still better than any of the other PCs <laughs> I've got around here. Because cause I hang on to my equipment until every last little electron is squeezed out of the thing and it won't do anything anymore. That's yeah. awesome. So. <laughs> That's the way to roll. So, we so do our... Uh, our, all our audio work on our Mac Mini, which is, gosh, I must have got it. Uh, Six, seven years. 2006, 2007. Yeah. No, you got it 2006. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I've had it for many, many years now, and yep. it's still kind of working. It's limping. Yeah, well, and, you know, I'll, as I started putting the equipment together and trying to figure out Okay, everybody says you need multiple cores to render your video and you need all this power and yeah, okay, let's go back and really look. And I talked to some other people and the thing is, I, I mean, what I bought was a two-core Pentium, which is dirt cheap and far from the current power levels mm -hmm. of modern systems. But I took that new system with uh, what it came with, XP Pro, and stripped out every last bit of software that doesn't absolutely have to be there right. to run audio or video, and that thing just rocks. I mean, it's it's speedy. I mean, I 
I see other people talk about how long it takes to render this or that or the other thing. And this PC just sitting by itself with nothing else running just cooks right through that. So for less than 200 bucks, I got the PC that's going to do nothing but that, but it's optimized for it and it does real well. Right. And is that you know, 720p video that you're rendering? Uh, yeah. Hmm. How, so how long uh, for, say, I don't know, about a 10-minute video? I haven't done a 10-minute video oh. <laughs> yet, but based on the three, four-minute one. Okay. A three, no, four minute three, video. three, four-minute videos I, I can render really fast, but you get anything about eight and a half or higher, and it, it just exponentially gets longer and longer with each second that you add. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is, okay, so I guess I really don't know how fast the render will be. For longer ones. But from the anecdotal stuff I've been hearing and reading online, I really don't care because sure. that computer, <laughs> sure. the computer isn't going to be doing anything else. else it's right. not like I've got a, I can't get back online until that computer's done doing the render. Right. I can just hit go and right. and that leave like it for hours. Yeah, I yeah. wish I had that uh, capability, but I use my main machine to do the video editing and rendering. So when it's rendering, man, I just stuck. I can't get anything else done. We just yeah. get a two hundred dollar Pentium dual core processor. Yeah, that's the last thing I need is another computer <laughs> piled up on here. So then, so. what what else what else do you have in your setup currently? Because I know you had to muck through some stuff, though. I don't know exactly what specifically you, you ended up having to go through. So, like, what did you end up having to address, and what have you come up with since? Well, the, the first issue was getting what I consider decent video. And, you know, and that's another one that it, you, you really have to decide what do you want your end product to look like. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I see a whole lot of people out there that post videos and have video blogs using low-res webcams, and they're just happy with that. And right. I wasn't going to be happy with that. Um, it was <laughs> I was a bit disappointed because over the years I've accumulated – a lot of analog video gear. I mm -hmm, mean, mm -hmm. high-end cab, some high-end cameras, um, a lot of really nice optics, and I got a high-end video converter that'll take the analog in mm -hmm. to the PC, and my high-end converter and my high-end camera and my high-end optics look like crap because <laughs> it's oh, still no. analog video, and you, you just can't get the resolution out of it. So, oh, no. Even Basically, with the, I, even with a high quality converter. Yes. Oh. Well, even it's video, that, it's, so you know the it's doing what NTSC yeah. quality. It's just you know nothing compared to what we can do with 720p these days. Oh, that sucks. Right, you convert an NTSC analog video into digital, and it is not as good as a twenty dollar webcam. <laughs> God, that sucks. So it was a big disappointment. I packed yeah. all that gear up and bought the uh, the what the Microsoft Life Cam, the same one you guys picked up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. my tests with that show that this fifty dollar camera just runs rings around <laughs> all the other analog and stuff I had. So that's I have that for video, and then the uh, the little flip. Um, that I got from you guys. Thank you again very much. Anytime. Uh, <laughs> well, not anytime. We only had the one. Well, yeah. Let's be clear on that. You can't have the other cameras. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who um, don't know, uh, we won a little flip video camera through a giveaway contest that John was also entering into because well, he really wanted it for his show. We didn't know about it, this contest, and John suggested or said that there's this contest, so I entered it in and of course instead of john winning i won and uh john had wanted the the flip cameras so we sent it to him <laughs> yeah we already have a flip ultra hd so we just sent him the flip yep and you guys are awesome for that <laughs> no so but anyway i've been playing with that and the video off the flip mm -hmm. i'm pretty impressed with um okay. i'm absolutely going to be able to use the video the audio on the flip is absolutely horrible <laughs> and is completely unusable. So we use it for our show, the onboard audio. We use it all the time. But I don't, you know, I don't know if there's a big difference. There between... is a huge difference between the audio that we're going to be able to get on the podcast here 
using our recording studio equipment and what we normally put up on YouTube. Well, no, that's not what I mean. What I mean is I don't know if there's a big difference between the audio used on the Flip that John has and the Flip Ultra HD that we have. I imagine the audio is probably pretty close to the same. You that's think so? That's a much more um, standardized technology. They pretty much do it the same across the board. Like, how crappy does it sound on the Flip for you? Well, you, you, you know, the thing is, the audio on the Flip, if if that camera is within a couple of feet of what you're recording, yeah, and your only video source is going to be... the the audio and video off that camera, it's usable. Um, the issue, if you're using the flip to do longer shots, you know, I'm uh. doing pieces of video where I'm making this gigantic workbench and the camera's 10 feet away. It sounds right. horrible. Right. Plus right. the audio, if, you know, in a lot of cases, I envision wanting to edit together video shot on the flip and video shot in my shop with the life cam, mm -hmm. it's the difference in the audio that makes it totally unacceptable. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Because while the flip audio is okay, you know, I'm, I've got the Audio Technica mic in the shop mm -hmm. that's, you know, 24 inches above my head and sounds really, really good. So then when I try to edit together those pieces, it's just <laughs> it's like be, three, just three completely different. Yeah, it'll be Sounds. glaring that the the audio is horrible on the little thing. So now I'm investigating a little standalone portable audio recorder. I sent you guys the link to that. Yeah, um, we uh, actually are recording on that standalone video recorder right now. That's how we're recording the podcast. Right. Do you need to get that? No, I could ignore it, but it's not going to stop ringing. <laughs> The, there, I muted it. <laughs> so I'm back. <laughs> Never fails. Yeah, so uh, you're talking about the little Sony recorder, right? The little Sony uh, portable recorder. Yeah. Which, right. you know, it's, you know it's, it would be really nice if you had plenty of money and you could go buy a, a really nice multi-channel digital audio recorder. I tell you what, Jen, you know that uh, little Cascade preamp that I designed the other day? Uh-huh. If you were to take that and your dynamic uh, Audio-Technica mic and plug it into this thing, you're going to get extremely good audio. From my tests over the last few days with this, you're going to be absolutely fine. Really? Yeah, mm -hmm. just it's, it's great. Audio quality is really good on it. Okay, I think now, I'll be buying one of those. Not necessarily through its onboard electric mics but through its uh microphone input as long as oh, you preamp it it's going to be amazing i never would have presumed to use an internal mic in anything <laughs> <laughs> to record video like that's ultimately going to be put out yep yep <clears throat> so that's good to hear i may actually get that i don't know that i'd use my audio technica um might find a a good little clip on a, a lavalier Lapel. or something. Yeah, you could hang a room mic and uh, do it that way. So, but basically, what I wanted the flip and the the audio recorder was doing remote stuff mm -hmm. out there. You know, I I have in mind several videos that are going to be in weird places where. You know, I'm just, you know, in my shop, I shoot video with this dedicated PC. I am not going to lug that anywhere. <laughs> no. So I have to have a portable solution. Right. So We actually made that comment here in the studio yesterday when we were setting up uh, to start using this portable recorder as our dedicated hardware recorder. And I got it working. And I was like, you know what? Technically, we're our, with the cascaded uh, preamp, we are actually capable of setting up a little camera rig that has the hardware recorder, the flip, and a uh, little preamp box, and a microphone, and we could go mobile. Uh, we could go out and record in the field if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is exactly what I want to do. I mean, there's some some awesome surplus electronic stores that'd be fun to go walk through and shoot a <laughs> video. Or you know, gotta be careful my, of your wallet there. <laughs> yeah, my. Uh, my favorite Goodwill stores, I was thinking I could do an episode on where do you actually find metal? If That'd you're going to build great. something and you need a piece of metal, well, I've got eight different places where 
you know, from literal junkyards that I go haunt to an honest to God industrial metal supplier over in Tempe that I buy stuff from. Mm. That's just going to be really interesting uh, content, especially for folks that are our age, because our parents' generation were the generation of people that didn't want to necessarily do things themselves. They wanted to pay other people to do it. So they didn't, you know, show us the ropes on how to go to necessarily to a junkyard to get something you need or to a metal <laughs> warehouse and mm -hmm. be able to pick out what you need or how to tell how how much wood you need in board feet. You know, they just right. didn't necessarily teach people our age that stuff. And it's people our age that are getting into this maker community online and watching these YouTube videos and going out there and wanting to do projects. And we're ending up spending a lot more money on materials than we should be because we oh, simply we, don't we, know all the tricks and tips that all you old hats have. Yeah, way more than you have to, you know, because there's a whole lot of of the, the younger people getting in here that, well, you know, you got <laughs> you, you well, uh, the uh, the inch and three quarters aluminum angle stock you found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, they'll need some. They know what they need. They know basically the shape, but if Home Depot doesn't have it for them, mm -hmm. they're going online and paying shipping. And, you know, there are, you know, six or seven places I would go to look for that angle iron or angle aluminum. Where here. is that? Pardon me? Where? <laughs> Off the top well, of your head. Well, you, okay, here's one of the little secrets that a lot of people don't realize. Um, you know, most any... I'm not even going to say major, large-ish city is going to have a place where everybody goes to sell all the scrap metal they accumulate. Sure. Okay? Sure. There are three of them within 20 miles of me here, and two of the three will pull good, people will bring in aluminum scrap mm -hmm. and sell it. They will pull out good dimensional pieces and put it in racks, and you can go buy it by the pound. Wow, and, you, and that's usually the best the price cost, you're going to get. Yeah. Wow. The cost here typically is twice the salvage rate. So with aluminum at, I don't know, it's, I think it's knocking on $2 a pound. <laughs> you're going <gonna>, to <laughs> buy angle iron at oh like three fifty a pound. It's not by the inch. It's not by the foot. It, all they care about is what's the damn thing weigh. Oh you know, so gosh. it's the melt value times 150%. Yeah, like, I mean, here we were, we went to Home Depot to, I don't think we got the angled aluminum, did we? No, we, we didn't. We got just a short piece for yeah, finishing up the piece. SID organ, but uh, the, like... the more bulky order of that stuff, we actually found a really good online source that's going to ship it for free and has a really cheap price. But, but yeah, you, you there, sent me that link, and that's actually a pretty darn good price. Yeah. But you know? at Home Depot, for sure, I mean, we saw some pieces that were, I don't know what. Thirty dollars, forty dollars for like for a, a couple of feet of aluminum. Feet, yeah, exactly. Home Depot and Lowe's are absolutely the most expensive sure. metal you can conceivably <laughs> buy. Sure, sure. Um, it's an awesome place to go buy two by fours and paint. Yeah. You know, and if you need odd nuts and them. bolts, they're pretty good for that too. But yeah. man, weird dimensional metal stuff, expanded sheet metal, sheet metal of any kind. That's not where you want to be. Hmm. Or glass or plexiglass. Right. <laughs> right. You know, right. just the raw material stuff. Right. You know, you, you can almost always do better. So, but anyway, background, uh, you know, that's just one of the, one of the video episodes I want to be able to shoot, but that means I've got to be able to do audio and video at eight different remote locations <laughs> and bring it all back here and edit it up. And I hear everybody on there say, Oh my God, it's going to take you forever to edit. Well, I'm, I guess I'm still a newbie because I love editing. That's fun. <laughs> Putting all those pieces together and everything. Uh, Whereas I'm, we've got to edit two episodes a week. So our editing happens, you know, in the camera where, you know, we just don't screw up <laughs> so that we don't retake. have to edit anything. And, um, uh, then I can just drop it in to my editor, cut off the beginning when you get the little pot from turning on the camera, cut off the end where you've got the little pot from turning off the camera, throw on my intro, my outro, I'm done. Okay, move on. Done. Next thing. 
Well, ba basically what I plan on doing is one, maybe two major, I mean, I'll, to me it sounds pompous to call them productions, but a major video, which is researched and edited and it's got the web page backing it up and it's it's all put together maybe one or two a month of those mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and what I've actually already done is set up a second YouTube channel um, that I just called the back channel and there I'm just gonna drop one two minute knockoffs you know wacky things going on at my bench or odds and ends Stuff that's not documented. Um, sure. I'm kind of taking a lead from Jerry Ellsworth on that, actually, because, uh, you know, she does big production videos, and then she does just... The, like, knockoffs, yeah. Two minutes of her welding pipe on her race car, and right. she gets all these complaints that, well, you didn't say enough about it, and you didn't do this, and, <laughs> uh, you know, and it, it, well, that's not what that is. So right. she created her second channel, and I did that up front. Right. So I'm going to have those little drop-ins, God only knows how. Those won't, aren't going to be edited. It's just going to be a chunk of video cut, rendered, and uploaded. And it is what it is. We have our second so. channel as well, but we mostly use it for things that just really aren't related to the thought stream of our main channel. Yeah. Maker Dino has a second channel, too. <laughs> Maker Dino's got, like, three channels. <laughs> I think his cat has a channel too, doesn't it? Really? <laughs> Wouldn't Not surprise sure. me. <laughs> J Vet's channel. <laughs> so, That's but it's great. it's all coming together. Um, I can't do the remote stuff yet, but I'm pretty well set up uh, to start shooting in the shop. So That's great. We'll and do what, the little audio sequencer first as the uh, test run and uh, yeah. see how it goes from there. Yeah. And what uh, what software do you use to edit all your stuff? Uh, if anything the audio ed or video editor he yeah. does it through John Magic no what is it video pad no idea is that like the $50 yeah <laughs> yeah no I think it's $39 there nice. you go nice um, let me minimize you video pad video editor yeah cool um, so yeah I actually paid for that software um, I have nothing to do audio, but for the time being, I'm just going to drag the audio along with the video and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. go for that. I'm not going to have to worry about audio editing until I get field audio to work with, you know, where I'm recording a video stream and an audio stream different, separately and have to put them together. Right. Um, then I'll worry about an audio editor, mixer, whatever I need for that. Um, and then the little digital clapboard, and I'll be good to go there too. So, so you it's a mentioned lot of fun. Uh, yeah. that your first major project here is going to be a uh, sequencer, and uh, I've been paying attention to this one because I actually want to build one too. Uh, he's got uh, a five-five-five timer that he's using as a clock that's running some uh, a counter. And the counter is uh, running through a chip that picks one out of several resistors. And then the resistors are basically choosing the voltage that's going into a voltage-controlled oscillator. Now, this is very similar to a project that we covered in Episode 1, uh, Roy Eltham's Pinball Machine. Now, uh, the voltage-controlled oscillator is putting out a square wave. And what Roy did was um, set it up so that the the frequency, the, the width of the pulses change uh, according to the resistance, you know, according to the voltage being dropped across the chosen resistor. And that actually rotates a servo to a particular uh, rotation. And that uh, controls a dial on his scoreboard for his pinball machine. And you're doing the same exact thing here, really. But instead of using the pulse width modulation to control a servo, you're using it to create a frequency in the human hearing range. Correct. Well, he, he's also... No, that was, he was just using 555s, five, 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 wasn't he? Yeah, he mm -hmm. was using the 555 five, five and the, uh, the decade counter and the, uh, the, the mux, just like, just like your design. It's so similar. Yeah. 
it's very cool. Well, it's a real, it's a real basic design. And actually, what's funny using this the analog MUX chip and the counter strategy, you can go online and look up do-it-yourself analog synthesizers, musical synthesizers, and look at their sequencers, and that's basically what this is. Mm -hmm. There is very little difference between this circuit and those fairly high-end and expensive uh, analog synth modules. So, But this is really designed to be a real basic beginner circuit because it's... It's difficult to describe because I can't point at the schematic, but it's broken down into four or five standalone modules that have one chip each, and each one is very understandable by itself. So it's mm. one block feeds the next block feeds the next one. So it's I think it's a really good beginner circuit because you've got analog happening, you've got an audio amp, plus you got some digital counters, and right. it just ties it all together in one little pretty horrible sounding noise maker <laughs> and for john's show he's being very um productive and like professional about it he's got the video content that goes with it he's got the blog that goes with it he's got schematics that he's drawn up for it and uh you know it's all cohesively put together and cross-linked and you know all done properly completely opposite of how we do things which is all haphazard and all over the place <laughs> well you know and and i don't criticize anyone else but i will say that you know i've been following a lot of what's been going up on the web for quite a few years and there are a whole lot of sites where somebody's designed this thing and they put up their their blog post their page that's all text and has the schematics and they do a real good job of putting it all there. Mm -hmm. But video would help them explain portions of it a whole lot better. And here recently I'm finding a whole lot of YouTube channel people who are doing awesome projects and they'll do a 10 minute video and they have no website backing that up. Mm -hmm. There's no schematic out there. There's no discussion about how the circuit works. And I personally would enjoy pieces that, you know, in, in a good way, other. take the best of both worlds. Right. Okay. You know, using this little sequencer in the video, I can point out all the modules and tell what it is. And I can point to the low frequency oscillator, the 555, and say generally what those components do. Right. I'm not going to burn five minutes of video <laughs> explaining the formulas for how you calculate all this. I'll put all that in the text over on the web page. Right. So the super short attention span people can just watch the <laughs> video and not get bogged down in all that stuff. But people who really want to dig in a little deeper or want to reproduce it or want the schematic... All the documentation will be back there on the web page for the project, um, giving um, in excruciating detail <laughs> all the different pieces and parts of it. Well, it's just nice to be able to have the full picture, you know, detail yeah. and in generic. So. Right. Now, there's, I'm sure there are people out there doing it where they do both, the, you know, the, the video and then the backup text and and drawings and pictures on a website, um, I just haven't come across many of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there's, a, there's a YouTube guy I just subscribed to that builds audio amplifiers. All he does is video. And he's mm -hmm. done some awesome stuff. And I'd love to see the schematics. And I'd love to see a better discussion of what's going on. But he does seven-minute videos, and that's all he does. Right. There is no web page backing him up. Right. Yeah, um, and a lot of people don't realize how much time goes into that seven-minute video. I mean, it's not seven minutes. It's, you know, it usually takes at least a half hour to shoot seven minutes correctly. And yeah. uh, it takes a few hours to get it all edited and then an hour or two to get it rendered and uploaded and all of that. It's, uh, you know, it's a full-time job just doing that seven-minute video once a week or twice a week. Well, the post, too, though. And I had to say that because I write a post every day. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, I mean, we're lucky because there's two of us. You know, she's she's got the blog under you know her control there, and she does a daily blog post. And 
I mostly take care of the back end for the videos, so we're able to split the work, and that allows us to get a lot more done than most people can. I can't imagine trying to do, uh, come up with a project, build a project, shoot a project, edit a project, upload a project, to do a blog post <laughs> on a project. You know, that's well, like, wow, that is John a serious undertaking. <laughs> but, you know, uh, rem John's remember? also looking at it in terms of uh, he wants to do one of these every two weeks, not two every week. Well, remember I said one to two a month. Yep. I mean, I have no illusions that this is going to be easy. I mean, the, right. the, you know, you take this little sequencer as an example. I see that the finished thing probably being the video in the 15-minute range, mm -hmm. probably broken across three videos. So to get that 15 minutes done, and I'm just wild-ass guessing here, I'd say doing the audio video, the prep, the shoot, the edit, is probably five hours. Jeez Louise. Yeah. And then all the online documentation, the writing, yeah, the checking, the drawing, the schematics, time. putting the page together, get it all. That's probably another eight to 10 hours. Yeah. Easily. Yeah. To put the, so. Yeah. And you've you always know, done a very good and good job and comprehensive job on your posts. So, yeah. I that actually is. get criticized for that. Well, Fuba, so, Puba on them. Puba on them because put a comment up. Boy, this guy sure likes to read his own stuff. No, oh, forget it. Forget it. But yeah, it. that doesn't Ignore bother me in the slightest because you know, yeah. the, you always have to picture your audience, and you know, the audience I picture for the stuff I want to do isn't the forty-five-year-old engineer that's been in the career for right. twenty-five years. Right. It's not the the hobbyist that's been building stuff for 15 years. Mm -hmm. I, when I picture somebody, I'm picturing the 15 year old high school kid. That's just starting to learn this stuff. Right. And I write it to teach a high school kid that does not have an engineering degree, does not have a couple of decades of experience. Right. And you know what? You got to take it slow and you got to explain everything. Or the 27 year old complete noob at electronics <laughs> right here. <laughs> well, the, uh, they're pretty rare, actually, I think. <laughs> but, you know, the other side of that is that you is can't a late do bloomer. that on video. <laughs> I mean, to, to go component through component through the, I mean, the sequencer right. is a very simple little circuit. And right. to go into that depth in video, you're look, it's three hours worth of video. Right, right. You, you know, it's crazy. So you have to back off and do that in text back on the web page. Right. Unless you're um, really good and then you can explain how a Hammond work, organ works in less than, you know, six minutes. Right. No. Or you have a whole lot of money and you have uh, production assistants and you have a camera guy and you have a tech guy and you have somebody that edits for you. <laughs> You know, yeah. the, the the current Leo Laporte model of operation. Right. Um, not to knock that. I'd, I'd love <laughs> to have a million-dollar studio. I would, too. But, um, so, no. So, yeah. so where can we find your uh, your amazing and awesomely comprehensive blog posts at? Well, my website, hackersbench.com. Okay. The content that's there now has pretty much been untouched for... <laughs> Uh, two years for the most part. Okay. Um, it's poised, ready to strike. It's, it's well, actually, I got kind of tired of doing it, and a whole bunch of other life complications came in, and they went away, and I decided I was going to relaunch the website mm -hmm. with this different approach that I wanted to do. <coughs> Excuse me. Then I decided I wanted to do the video. Then I had to figure out all this. So <laughs> it's. <laughs> I, I could have had my relaunch 18 months ago if I hadn't got tangled <laughs> up in all this video stuff. But um, I'm no. sure in the end it'll all be worth the work, though. I think so. I'm gonna. I'm enjoying putting it all together. I'll tell you that. Yeah, so that's great. But um, yeah, the first project should be all up and posted within a couple of weeks, I think. So hackersbench.com is the website. Hackersbench TV is the main YouTube channel, right? Is the main YouTube channel. Yep. Cool. There's not uh, too many videos up there, but uh, there are a few of the early video tests and a few explanations of the sequencer that we've been talking about. Now, this would not be zombie tech unless we really grilled you here and said, <laughs> okay, you're working on the sequencer, 
but you know this is not useful technology unless you can convince us that it's useful in a zombie apocalypse or any of your other projects no no this one specifically i want to know how <laughs> you can use a oh, Lord. a uh, a step sequencer to fight zombies well, to fight zombies, the analog MUX chip used in there will switch any analog signal. So you could take all of those cheap surplus video cameras and have perimeter security oh. switch through this device to monitor your entire perimeter. Oh, so you can or, actually as do you video guys heard switching? On the, I'm sorry? You can actually do video switching through one of those MUX chips? NTSC video, you sure can. Wow. <laughs> It, it's it's a, how much it's does a, one of these chips cost? Like ten cents? Well, the forty cents. Okay, so, so forty, 40 cents, cents video switcher. I like it. So, well, yeah, but it's analog video, so well, still good luck with that. <laughs> and plus, as you heard, the very first demo of this thing, I can produce horrifying ultrasonic audio frequencies, <laughs> which just Are zombies true. repelled by. Infrasonic audio? We don't know yet. We don't uh, know yet. I, I hear well, that uh, some studies on what brain damage they would have to have to display the behaviors, which they tend to have in the movies, would say that they would be highly distractible. <laughs> well, then you could also use it to flash all kinds of different lights on and off all over the place. So, <laughs> so there you go. There's three zombie applications of the little sequence. Brilliant. That's Absolutely great. Absolutely brilliant. Um, we'll have to get you to set up the per, the the perimeter security cameras then. Now, John is an electrical engineer, and he can build all sorts of neat and useful things that could help rebuild society uh, in the case of major problems. More than you know. And uh, <laughs> he also I was does. A, I was a manufacturing engineer. Yeah, which is you know, that's something that a lot of hobbyists uh, would never get into some of the things that you obviously had to be very good at. Yeah, well, I could give a 15-minute commercial on why any young person that's like a hacker maker now should be thinking about manufacturing engineering over a straight double E. Go for it. Uh, I'm sure there's not nearly as many people <laughs> getting into that aspect of it. I know, well, but... The, well, okay. It, okay, in a, uh, <laughs> the nickel <laughs> statement, okay? Okay. When you're a manufacturing engineer, like I was at Motorola, um, the scope of what you have to deal with is incredibly broad, okay? An EE working in our same plant sat at his desk and designed end products, which were all digital computer stuff, and that's what he did. Mm -hmm. As a manufacturing engineer, I had to do some circuit design for interfacing all the equipment on the assembly line. I was in charge of motor controls, programmable logic controllers. I had to know pneumatics. I had to know Jeez. hydraulics. I had to know high voltage electricity. You have to deal with building codes. Oh. <laughs> so really, it, it, as a manufacturing engineer, if you get into a really good plant, you get to play with everything. everything. That's amazing. You know, so on a Monday, I might be... Make, you know, trying to figure out how to plumb half-inch copper pipe to get air to where I need it. And two days later, I'm taking apart a $2 million Siemens pick-and-place machine <laughs> trying to get the pick-and-place accuracy. You, you do it all. and you, So if you're, uh, I don't know, ADHD or you have an immense scope of interest, <clears throat> it really is, I think, the best engineering field to go into. That's very cool. Not There really aren't that many people who think about that. Um, um, you know, about being able to give themselves that amount of breadth, I think. I think in engineering, the trend has been towards specialization over the last 40 years. And you've got the folks that basically they do their engineering <laughs> in their little tiny bubble yeah. and they don't have a broad, uh, a broad range of how wide of a discipline engineering actually is. And, right. and if and if you just look at the economy now, you know, a, a while ago, becoming very specialized engineer made a whole lot of sense to go mm -hmm. find that job and make a whole lot of money. And it worked for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But if you lose that job, that's all you know how to do. You go through a manufacturing engineering world. I mean, 
you lose your job. You can go be a manufacturing engineer somewhere else because the actual process doesn't matter. All the principles and the blocks are the same. Hmm. All the way down to you could go be a plumber because you learned all that stuff. You could go work with hydraulic systems. You know. So do you fix all the know, systems at home? Like in your house? Are you Everything except the air conditioner. Amazing. And actually, I built a 550-square-foot addition to the house. And other than hiring a crane <laughs> to lift this 800-pound beam 18 <laughs> feet in the air, because I actually came up with three or four ways to do it, but <laughs> I had a chance of dying in every last one of them, so I gave up and actually hired a crane to come lift it. Aside from that, I built the whole thing. That's amazing. I, from framing to sheetrock to plumbing to electrical to drains and sewers to vents. Good well, no, I hired the carpet guy, too. I don't do carpet. You don't do carpet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh, carpet's <laughs> such a pain. So, you know, as a career, maybe being a specialist or a highly vertical specialist is a good thing. But as an individual, having as broad a scope of experience as possible is the best thing you can do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then, for the zombie apocalypse, obviously besides setting up perimeter camera security, wh- see, this is the thing, because you could end up building our entire compound. Yeah, not right? just that, building the we equipment that's required to build it. hijack a crane. You know, that's the important part that most people don't really think about it. You need the technology to build the technology, right? Exactly. Yeah. If you don't have the that's tools... True then you're not going to be able to create things like a uh, microchip. Yeah. You know, how many people know how to create a fab? Can I ask a silly question? Could you DIY a soldering iron? Yeah. Sure. Really? Jerry Ellsworth did when she was a kid. Yeah. Is that difficult? It's dangerous, but you can do it. <laughs> well, uh, it's a, probably the easiest way to DIY a soldering iron would be to make it run on propane. Oh my gosh! I don't know. Well, no, and then you'd have a contained flame that heats the back end of the tip, and then you use the tip to solder. That would be the uh, simplest way to do it, because you got to presume you're not going to have electricity now and then. I yeah. guess that is true. Getting propane is somewhat of a challenge. <laughs> well, who says it's got to be propane? Getting methane is far easier. Yeah. Everybody farts? Yeah. Well, without going into <laughs> graphic <laughs> detail. Yeah, you can Your build community effluent systems. has to go somewhere, and that will create oh, methane. Which can gross. Be and that methane can be used to <laughs> run it. internal combustion engines and other things. Absolutely. Well. Wow. Don't you remember that from that British TV show in the 70s, The Good Life, or Good Neighbors, I think it's called as well? That was a good he, show. That's what he built his uh, little generator in his house was on... Uh, Methane fumes? The uh, pig poop oh, from the gross. pigs he was raising in the backyard. That's right. I remember yeah. that. Huh. So, and it, well, and there you go. And that's just energy. Interesting. You got to cook. You got to heat the place. You got to sterilize water. There's, yeah. Oh, my gosh. And you have fruit trees in the middle of the desert, too, that are growing. Yeah. Yeah. There's two dozen out there. Two dozen. Have they, wait, when are they going to give fruit again? Uh, usually it's best um, late November through December. Oh, wow. Okay. Being Arizona, I mean, our season is kind of skewed. Right, right, right. So, but, I mean, all the fruit is set right now. It just takes several more months to, uh, before you can eat it. The pomegranates are ripe now, though. Well, how do, you, how do you grow plants in the desert? Like, how do you grow fruit trees in the de- desert do you have to like just deliberately water them yes you act c- with complete disregard to the ecology of the planet gotcha you pump tons of water onto them. <laughs> gotcha so. <laughs> you well, convince them that they're growing and... somewhere else say again you, you just keep it, it a secret from the plants that they're in the desert <laughs> i see yeah. <laughs> yeah it's mostly a fun and, and actually yeah. citrus you go way back. Most citrus, uh, the origins are Mediterranean, and the climate's very similar to here. Sure, sure. Um, but they just take lots of water. But ecologically speaking, okay, what's the worst? Okay, so I put a lot of water on these things, or I can go to the store and buy oranges that got shipped here from Brazil. Right. right. 
That's, in a that's, freighter there, burning. There is a point. There is a point. That is true. Yeah, it's well, now the the true greenies that say, well, don't eat oranges unless they're in season and grown locally with available water. <laughs> it's like, okay, we can take this too far. <laughs> I like my grapefruit. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get scurvy. That's what no, yeah, rickets. we we don't want any of that bow leggedness. That's right. No. <laughs> I like the idea of being able to create sort of a year-round, self-sustained, indoor... Hydroponics. You know, hydroponics farms. That's, you know, a much better idea than, like, shipping grapefruit up from Brazil. I mean, that's just stupid the way that we're doing it right now. There's better Actually, ways to approach the problem. I played with hydroponics in my old house. Did you? Yeah, I grew tomatoes in the garage. How'd that go? It went really, really well. I no. mean, it was kind of an experiment. I built the whole thing and built the electronics and got a bunch of tomatoes and they got bored with it. <laughs> you got bored with hydroponics. <gasps> well, it's a, the, I don't know. Because it's, don't know. What, it's a self-sustaining thing? Well, it has to be, right? To some well, extent. Yeah. well, the thing is I wanted to learn how to do it and once I learned how to do it, my mission was done. You know, it wasn't my goal was to learn it. My goal wasn't to start a gigantic hydroponic thing. But well, what, what a lot of people don't most? realize is hydroponics, there is a lot of work that goes into keeping that all going. Right. So what's the, this might be a difficult question to answer because I'm pretty naive in terms of hydroponics, but what's the most difficult part of getting the hydroponic system to work? Getting it to work is easy. Keeping it working is the hard part because you have to monitor the chemistry of the water you keep pumping through those trays. You have to watch the pH mm. of the water and all the nutrients you got to put into it. I mean, it, it's pretty complex. So what, what put, uh, like nutrients did you have to put into it? Oh, I don't remember exactly, but it was an over-the-counter um, soluble fertilizer. Oh. You know, and they have the three numbers for the magnesium, potassium, and calcium, I guess. Oh, I see. And I don't remember what it is. But there's gobs and gobs of websites that talk about you know, how to make and maintain the solution that goes through there. Right, right, right. Yeah, so, I think it'd know, be more I, useful to, like, know how to actually produce that that uh, soluble fertilizer yourself. Because, I mean, I mean in, in today's context, yeah, it's fine. Go to the store, buy it. But in the context of this show, you really kind of want to know how, <laughs> how they to. made that stuff that you can well, buy. And, it, and it's, it's kind of funny because, you know, the most important part of it is the... Uh, the um, Nitrates, right? The nitrates, the nitrogen. Mm. Yeah. And, and so we're right back to your community effluent yeah. again. Right. I mean, you're basically <laughs> getting the poop to the right uh, the right uh, fermented state and then uh, you know, dissolving it. Gross. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's... I've noticed that some people around are experimenting with uh, combining fish farming and yeah. hydroponics because you Cold. can use the fish poop as the food for the plants and you can use the uh <laughs> the worms that you're using with the plants and all that is you know fish food yep, that's called aquaculture interesting. i imagine there's a lot of ways to approach that but i'm making a face right now but that's very interesting <laughs> so, i'm the just the is, nurse <laughs> most people that do hydroponics are pushing to get absolutely the maximum yield they can out mm -hmm. of their hydroponic system right because there's only so much room that they're putting, right. they're able to put the system in. To do that, you push the the we'll call it the fertilizer levels so high, fish aren't going to live in that water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing's going to live in that water mm -hmm, mm -hmm. other than the plants. So right, aquaculture works, but you get a much lower yield out of the system. Sure. So well, we're just going to have to hijack a few um, ginormous warehouses then. Yeah. That's definitely on my list of things to do in the case that society needs help getting back on its feet is uh, reclaiming some warehouses for the greater good. <laughs> Especially this ones for full the greater of cool good. stuff. Get out. <laughs> well, no, not well, ones I, that are occupied. There should be a lot of vacant ones. There should be. We just got to chase the zombies out with my ultrasonic sequencer. <laughs> There we go. Quick, I there's could one build behind into something you. that looks like a gun with a big ultrasonic horn sticking out the front. Some uh, sonic weaponry built from 555s. Five I love it. 
That's great. So you everybody know me. gets I a love bullhorn. anything that uh, mixes uh, audio production into the into the solution. You bet. <laughs> Well, okay, well, then we got to put the audio recorder on the gun along with the flip cam so that we can document chasing all the zombies off, right? That's great. Yeah. So we could we could still be vid- vloggers and bloggers while we're killing the zombies. That's right. Give everybody tips. Then everything will be open source because everybody's going to want to find more methods of uh, killing zombies. Speaking of open source, open hardware, uh, did you guys see a while back that guy that put together the open hardware and open source plans for the uh, major tools that are required to rebuild society? Oh, I did see that. You get like a backhoe. Yeah, and a yeah. tractor. Uh, I Whoa. I forget what all the pieces were, but yeah, yeah. I I, I'm not going to list them or anything. But basically, he came up with a modular design of a set of parts that can be reconfigured into each of the major, made you know, big pieces of equipment that you need to be able to do things like you know, road construction and really? building of That's larger so buildings cool. and How cutting cool. trenches and. All that kind of, you know, splitting logs and... Do you remember the name of the guy? No. Or the project? No, but I'm sure with a little bit of Google searching... I probably could. Somebody could could find find it very easily. Yeah, I saw it listed on another blog, and I can't remember where it was. Um, I saw it uh, a few months ago, and then Chris Gamble tweeted it again a couple days ago. Because, you know, Chris is slow. He (laughs) he uh, catches up, (laughs) but it takes him a while. (laughs) But I'm an engineer. I looked at that site and said, I could do better than that. Oh. Oh, and I could do better than that. Oh, I, boy. I do it this way. Oh, boy. <laughs> so. I'm glad you're on our team. It's interesting <laughs> when you add that element to it where the, the parts can be, you know, you can disassemble one unit and be able to build the other unit from the same building blocks. I think that's right. an extremely useful part of it. Mm-hmm. And that's all hydraulics. That's great. As I remember, most of his stuff was hydraulically operated. That's great. A lot of people would look at that guy and not understand why what he's doing is so, you know, useful, even in, you know, reality's context. Because you take that technology and you you drop it on the ground in the middle of Minnesota and it's, you know, basically worthless. Because, you know, you can go down to the, the equipment shop and rent whatever you need. But you take that same technology and you drop it off in a developing country where they don't have access to that kind of stuff. Oh, absolutely. And suddenly, you know, they can do things that, you know, enable them to build their own economies up from the ground up. Right. So Pretty impressive stuff. Yeah. Now, okay, sorry, random question again because I'm still stuck on the zombie apocalypse bit. The three tools you would take... Um, in an impending zombie apocalypse. Three tools that I would take? Yes. The three power tools or tools. Holy cow. (laughs) They can be power tools. Yeah, they can be power tools. Because we'll find some way to, you know, deal to get a generator. Roy's bringing his solar panels. Yeah. He's going to strap them to the back of his car. Yeah. Well, then I would take a sawzall. A saw? Yeah. Okay. Sawzall. Whisker yeah. knows what a sawzall is. I have yeah. no idea what that is. It's like a, take, it's about gay big, and it's got a reciprocating saw blade that sticks out of the front that does, you know, this. Uh-huh. You can use it to pretty much cut anything. Oh, okay. And a table saw and a welder. Oh, a welder. We don't have one yet. Good. It'd All be right. extremely useful to Probably have a welder. Useful. That's true. I think uh, so Roy's bringing with, the Prout power drill, so... With those three things, you could take just about anything apart and turn it into something else. Cool. I dig it. Pretty good selection. So that's what I dig. I dig it. I dig it. All right, so we've got a few minutes left here in our hour. Uh, anything else we wanted to cover before we finish this up? Um, any any other projects that you're thinking that you're kind of mulling over for your Hackers Bench show? <laughs> okay, let my little geek engineer side show. I have a spreadsheet that lists 27 projects. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Sounds kind of light. <laughs> kind of light. 
So yeah, I'm, that means I'm booked for 18 months, right? That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So what do you think is going to be the next one up after the sequencer? After this will be the frequency counter. Frequency counter. Like a, an accurate frequency counter? A pretty darn accurate frequency counter that has no microcontroller in it. Oh. Okay, so are you going to use like a temperature-controlled crystal or something? It's the time basis crystal. Um, it's not going to be temperature based. So it's not going to be the accuracy of a, of a lab instrument. Um, but for most hobbyist needs, it's perfectly fine. Even for probably most ham radio needs. Cool. Um, it'll read up to five megahertz. <clears throat> if you really need, if you need real tight accuracy, you know, go buy one. You can buy one for a couple hundred bucks. That's absolutely accurate. Th this is a much more simple, portable, easy to understand how it all works kind of frequency counter. And it doesn't cost two hundred dollars. Doesn't cost anywhere near two hundred dollars. Costs go. more like thirty bucks. Amazing. You are like Maybe. our go-to guy for for cheap, innovative solutions. If you think about it, I mean, you're doing your signal generation with your sequencer right so you're right. being able to do your own uh signal generation with that to some extent and but you can't tell exactly what frequency it is you add the frequency to it now you've got a useful tool which is your frequency counter and that makes your uh your signal generator more useful because you can actually dial in the frequency that it's operating at and use it as a test signal yeah and uh and I'm sure the next project, it sounds like you're getting on a theme here. You could uh, do something that is also useful as a uh, piece of lab equipment for a do-it-yourself electronics lab. Well, actually, the frequency counter is funny. Two things. If you go to hackersbench.com right now, you'll see I put up a project for a one hertz time base. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is the time base for the frequency counter. That's why I designed it. So the frequency counter is a bunch of stuff that adds on to that. And the reason I put together the frequency counter is because I wanted to build a weather station. Oh. And in the weather station, I wanted an anemometer to measure wind speed. And I built a sensor, but I had to calibrate that against speed. And the way you do that, you bolt it to the top of your car and your GPS tells you how fast you're going and you see what the frequency of the pulses are. So you can make a curve to know <laughs> what wind speed makes that thing spin how fast? I have a really good frequency counter. It's a Hewlett Packard rack mount, weighs 50 pounds. I can't throw that into the car to measure the sensor on the road. So I needed a real simple little battery powered basic frequency counter to read the wind sensor bolted to the top of the van to calibrate it. So that's why I made the frequency counter. Nice. So. Nice. That's basically that. That'll be an interesting uh, project to see come together. Which, or all. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to see if I can try some, because I've been interested in making a weather station type of thing, too. Like a tiny little, just typical, like, uh, temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, wind speed type of thing. That'll be useful well, for your ham station. Well, you'll love my anemometer sensor. Awesome. It's basically made out of PVC pipe, um, roller blades from Goodwill, <laughs> and soup ladles. Soup ladles. <laughs> my gosh. Awesome. You know, awesome. And, and it's not because I'm, you know, tr you know, eking out a living here. It's <laughs> because the, when I was getting started in electronics, I had zero money. Right. You know, Today, if I just wanted a, a wind sensor, well, there's 18 of them online and go throw my Visa card number at them and buy this $100 sensor. Right. Well, you know, when I was 15, 16, 17, I didn't have that kind of right. money. And I think it's much more interesting. How can you make working stuff with very little money, hopefully repurposing and recycling stuff along the way? So. Right. And this That's, is why John is going to be a guest more than once on this show. Because <laughs> is that a threat? We, <laughs> we have uh, a lot of information to download out of John's brain and into all of yours. Yes. Well, 
I got plenty to give. Wonderful. That pretty much wraps up our hour. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, and thank uh, you, John, for coming. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. It's yeah. been fun. <laughs> we uh, hijacked John at the last minute. We're like, hey, can you talk and sound intelligent and interesting for an hour straight? With and I five said, well, I can notice? talk. <laughs> <laughs> It seems to have gone pretty well. Indeed. Indeed. Well, I'm glad you're happy. <laughs> so that's it for this week. Uh, tune in next week for another uh, scintillating episode of Zombie Tech. Indeed. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.